Evening all. Has anyone got a watch I can borrow? Haven't you got a watch? You're living in rebellion against the Lord. He said, keep a watch, for you do not know the day or hour. All right then. All right then. All right, I'm going to try and keep my timing a little bit anyway. Praise the Lord. Yeah, well, say praise the Lord at the end, if I actually do. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, I've got a collection of them at home. Okay then, praise the Lord. We're going to do uh, John, John 15 tonight, okay? And uh, it's an interesting passage. There's been a lot of different interpretations made of this over the years. And um, I would say that, shall we say, all of them are valid. But a lot of them depend on the theological stance or the doctrines of the person who's interpreting what they're reading, okay? Um, of course, we've already said that we're taking all these passages from the point of view of Jesus talking to the disciples about Christian life, okay? The alternative is to take it as an end times uh, speech for all the way through. In which case, of course, this sounds like something to do with uh, Judgment Day, following the return of Jesus, you know. And uh, if this is a picture of judgment, then it's interesting because, of course, the question is, like, who is being judged? And uh, it would appear that maybe it's a warning against backsliding or being unproductive as a Christian. Is it a warning, you know, to people who are Christians who are not producing fruit, you know, not walking with the Lord, you know? So... That'd be rather interesting, but we're not taking it from an end times perspective. Uh, we're actually going to take it from the point of view of Jesus speaking to the disciples. Okay, so let's see how he is and uh, how he's going. And the fact of the matter is, that, of course, we remember that our context is that he is encouraging his disciples to get through the trials. All right, so I'm going to read from 15 verse 1. If you all found it. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. But if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. And if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words I have spoken to you. No, fa- no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you in this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen these miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. When the counsellor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes out from the Father, 
he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brother Joe, do you want to lead us in prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord. Lord, my Father God, that we come here tonight, my Father God, to learn from you. I ask my Father God that by your Spirit, my Father God, that you speak through, Lord. My Father God, a brother Jerry, into our hearts and souls and minds, my Father God. Lord Jesus, that we can grow in you. Lord, my Father God, this very night. Hallelujah, my God. In Jesus' name we pray. <coughs> thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Again, let us remind ourselves of the context of this because the whole reason why I'm doing a series of teachings on this, doing it consecutive all the way through in order, is because so often when we preach just a text here or a text there, we don't understand what goes before and what goes after, so therefore we can take it out of context and sometimes we can misunderstand it. You remember when I said months ago, when we first did the introductions, that, uh, you know, how would it be if you watch two minutes of a film right in the middle of the video? You haven't a clue what's going on. And this is the whole point. We're trying to do the whole thing from beginning to end so that we can get the sense of it. Okay. So what we need to remind ourselves of is the fact that in chapter 13, of course, at the Last Supper, Jesus washes his disciples' feet and he teaches them about servanthood, about humility. And at the end of that, of course, he starts to tell them that he's going to trial and that he's going to die. And Peter, at this point, proclaims his willingness, I'll lay down my life for you, I'm going to die. And as we come through to, into chapter 14, Jesus replies, no, you're going to deny me three times, but don't be troubled, because I'm going to give you strength. Don't worry, through trials and persecutions, you're going to have strength. And that strength, of course, is going to come from the Holy Spirit. And that's the whole point of this teaching from then onwards, is to teach the disciples about persecution. It gets stronger and stronger. As you get into chapter 16, he actually starts to specify exactly what's going to happen to them, and they know that they, too, are maybe destined for martyrdom. Okay? But they're going to have the strength, because, of course, if you ask somebody to do that, especially cowards, then, of course, they're going to go, oh, I can't do it. But the thing is this. When you think that you can't do something, that's when God kicks in, gives you the strength by the Holy Spirit, and you do things which are impossible. Okay, And that's the whole point of this story here. This is the whole point of this whole teaching is to get people to realize that they can do the supernatural things. In fact, it's those who think that they can do something are the people that can't be used by God. Peter, at this point, thinks, oh, I'm big and brave. I can be used by you. Um, you know, I can do something for you. And he has to realize that he's hopeless and useless before he finally goes on in the long term. As we know, the rest of his life, he went on and he produced great fruit for the Lord. And indeed, he died a martyr's death. Okay, according to historical sources, and it's mentioned there at the end of John 20, 21, I should say. Okay, and so this is what this whole thing is about. And within this, then, there's a lot of theology because, of course, the Trinity is mentioned many, many times. And a big theme that runs away through and really comes to its main part in chapter 15 is dwelling, dwelling in God. Okay. And we've already discussed temple replacement, the idea that the stone building in Jerusalem is done away with and it's replaced by Jesus. Indeed, it's replaced by the believers because we're living stones being built together. We are the dwelling place of God. The Holy Spirit dwells in here. We are the temple of God. Okay, this is where he lives now. And this is the whole point that Jesus, you know, in fact, it says in chapter one, I I forgot to mention it before. But in chapter one, of course, it actually says that the word becomes flesh and tabernacles amongst us. And when you look at Israel in the wilderness, the tabernacle was at the center. And the whole point was that everybody lived in their own tents, but God had his tabernacle there amongst his people. And Jesus, as it were, is that tabernacle. He is the temple of God. But then the believers, of course, become part of that as well. So it's a dwelling place of God. He tabernacles amongst his people here on earth. Do you understand? This is the body of Christ now in which he tabernacles, those who are believers. And this is what really this whole passage is about it's all about dwelling in God and God dwelling in you you are part of God and he is part of you do you understand so that we become one with God and God becomes one with us and you know this is the beauty of it because it's really talking about the fact that we are starting to partake of the divine nature okay in the sense that the Holy Spirit dwells within us and we're able to do supernatural things things that we couldn't think possible Hands up in here if you're a coward. Okay? You're too frightened even to lift your hand. All right? What's he going to do? All right? 
We're all cowards, all right? And the fact of the matter is that uh, I've seen people who would say the same thing, and yet in persecution, they've suddenly become brave. Not because they're stubborn, but because God has given them grace. And they've testified that at that particular point, they felt no anger, no malice, no hatred. They just felt strength, and they were ready to die. You know, if God had made it so, if God had been willing, they'd have gone then, and quite happily so. Quite remarkable. And the whole point of this is that this thing is to build them up. Okay, So straight away, we should start to see John 15 as being something which is supposed to strengthen people and build people up. Okay, We wouldn't expect to see much condemnation as part of a message like that. How would it be if you went to uh, comfort somebody and just condemn them? Wouldn't make sense, would it? You'd think, hang on a sec, maybe there's something else to this. <laughs> and um, indeed, I mean, as we come into chapter 15, there's a little note about the way that this is translated. These chapter divisions, these big 15s and 16s, they destroy the sense of the passage. Okay, Where you see at the end of chapter 14... The last verse ends with, come now, let us leave. That gives people the impression that Jesus has got up and gone to a different place. That's not actually so. As I understand it, actually this is supposed to be continuous, right the way through from chapter 14 into 15. And in fact, what he's saying is, cheer up. When he says, come on, the Greek is actually the word arise. Okay, it doesn't mean necessarily to stand up. It means cheer up. Elsewhere he uses similar words. Cheer up. Keep going. Okay, when he says, come on, let's leave, it says in the Greek, literally, go on from there. Okay, so keep going. Don't give up. Cheer up. And then it flows straight into chapter 15. He's saying, cheer up, keep going, because I'm the true vine. Makes much more sense. They haven't moved. We haven't changed subjects. This is not a separate teaching or a separate speech. This is continuous. I'm the true vine. And this is his answer. What he said so far in terms of doctrine, he now illustrates. And so if you found the last one where we were going through chapter 14 quite hard to accept and (coughs) quite hard to chew over in your mind, chapter 15 should be much easier because he actually illustrates it. But the point is this, he's saying the same things. Now in chapter 14 he didn't condemn anybody. He didn't bring anything like that. There was no warnings in that sense. There was warnings about persecution to come, but not warnings about what God was going to do to them. And the fact of the matter is that we are expecting the same message of comfort in chapter 15. Remembering, of course, as we said before, that comfort means to bring with strength. And it's quite an aggressive push. It's the keep going, keep fighting, don't give up kind of comfort. Not the sort of there, there, it'll be all right, dry it is sort of comfort, you know. Um, We're, you know, and in the context of preparing people for martyrdom and uh, and for uh, conflict, you wouldn't expect him to be saying there, there, dry it is and hug a teddy, okay. He's saying, look, keep going. You're going into a fight steel yourself, strengthen your hands, be stout-hearted, and keep going. But of course, we can't do that in ourselves. We can only do that with the strength of the Holy Spirit in us. All right, And this is what this whole message is about. It's all about how God is going to do something from within the believer, and he's going to make them able to do wonderful things. Okay, We might reapply those principles to other things apart from persecution and martyrdom, Uh, such as holiness of life or what have you that's fine but you're just reapplying the principle that's not exactly what he's talking about here okay the statement I am the true vine as you would expect is an ego amy saying an I am saying invoking the divine name of God and so it you know it stands out as a key 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 statement and the fact of the matter is also of course immediately we think oh there must be a link with the Old Testament and indeed there is The link is this, that the vine in the Old Testament was nearly always a picture of the nation of Israel. If the vine is Israel, it's interesting, however, that in places like Isaiah 5, which is the most famous one, it says, look, I've, I've cleared a piece of land, I've put a wall around it, and I've planted a vineyard. And I've given it everything, I've cleared all the stones out, I've given it water, So what do I expect? I expect a good crop of fruit. I expect beautiful fruit from this because I've given this vine everything that it could possibly need. Why then does it produce bitter fruit? And this is the thing. You see, God gave the nation of Israel 
everything they needed. He gave them a promised land. He gave them security. He gave them <coughs> supernatural help. He rescued them again and again. He gave them the scriptures, the prophets, the Holy Spirit. He gave them everything. So therefore, these people surely have no excuse. They should produce fruit for God. Godly people they should be. But no, they're unfruitful. In fact, they were sinful. They just gave away. They went to after idols. They went after material gain. They committed murder and intrigue and all sorts, and they became a real mess. They were an embarrassment to the name of God. And the fact of the matter is that when Jesus says here, I am the true vine, he's not necessarily renouncing Israel as such, but what he's saying is, I'm going to be a vine that will be true. I am purely good. In other words, Israel has become a wild vine, but I'm going to be a good cultivated vine. And therefore, this, fr this fruit will be good. The fruit that comes from this will be good. It will be godly. It will be pleasing to the vine dresser, who is, of course, God the Father. He will look and he will see and he will say, this is a great vine. And this is the thing, you see. What he's saying is, maybe there's a new beginning here. This is an announcement, again, like the new covenant. Do you remember in chapter 2, <coughs> Jesus made the water into wine? And the point of that wasn't that he was trying to give people things to make the party go. He was announcing a new covenant. He was saying there's a fresh beginning, a new harvest. And this is what he's saying. Look, we're going to start again. We're going to start again, and this time it's going to work. Why? Because the basis of this covenant is slightly different. Of course, as the Jews would see it, they saw the old covenant as being based on race. They thought everybody descended from Abraham was included in that covenant. Really, the basis was always faith. We've discussed that at length. Okay? When we went through the early chapters, we saw that there were Gentiles who believed who were included in Israel. There were Jews or Israelites who didn't believe and they were cut out. Okay? So the basis was always really faith. But now it is purely faith. It can't be misunderstood as even being race. Because now, from now on, these Jewish disciples, and I emphasize that they're all Jewish, are going to go out to the Gentiles. And that's why in chapter 10, Jesus spoke about sheep from another flock. And he said that the two flock would become one. He had Gentiles and he had Israelites and he was going to make them as one. And this is the beauty of it, you see. Um, the, the whole thing here is that we're going to see something different because human descent could always lead to problems. The basis of the first covenant, of any covenant, if it was a man, it was going to be a problem. You know, you look at, a, uh, at Adam for a start, go right back to the beginning. Adam signed up for humanity and everything went wrong. Noah signed a new covenant and everything went wrong. Abraham signed on for the old covenant, but eventually it went wrong. Moses signed on, and it went wrong. And it was repeating and repeating and repeating, but with this covenant, who's signing on for humanity? Jesus. And he won't go wrong. Okay? So this is slightly different, isn't it? Because now we've got a sinless human being as a basis for the covenant. This vine is going to be true. This vine is going to grow properly. This vine is going to produce fruit. And God the Father is going to make sure of it. Hallelujah. It's beautiful. Right? So it's all to do with the Old Testament, you see. Okay? And this is the thing. The whole basis of this is that this vine and these branches will produce fruit. Not might or should do, but will. That is a promise. That is an absolute. They will. Okay? There will need no exceptions to that. Any branches that are in this vine will produce fruit. And that is a key fundamental point to grab hold of before you go into the rest of this. That every branch that's in the vine is producing fruit and will produce fruit. Amen. Do you understand? Now that's a fundamental because so often, um, you know, we can, we can look at this and we can assume that we're talking about branches in the vine that are not producing fruit. If Okay, if your theology allows you to preach that, then all well and good. But really, a better passage for that is Romans 11. Romans 11 talks about a plant that's having branches grafted into it and there are warnings there about branches being broken off and there are warnings there you know, to consider the sternness and the kindness of God. Romans 11 is a much better place to preach a message from about that. Okay? Whereas John 15 here, to make that fit, that kind of thing, okay, you can do it, but you've really got to push it into place. You've really got to mold it to what you want it to say. And I'd rather just let the scripture speak for itself and see what the scripture says, right? And the scripture here, as the context, of the, I've underlined the context because the whole point is that he's trying to build them up. And the key, uh, the, the key fact to grab hold of 
the anchor point for all of this is that every branch in the vine will produce good fruit. Okay? And this is the thing. This is what really matters. All right? Um, in terms of the Old Testament, where, of course, it said that there were, uh, the, the vine went awry and it went off track or what have you, then the thing was that if the vine is Israel, in the early church, there were many Jews who wanted to become Christians and join the church, and they were seen as leaving Israel. They were seen as leaving um, their community to join this mixed Gentile church, the Christian church. And the fact of the matter is that really they weren't leaving Israel. In a sense, they can be seen to be joining the true Israel because Jesus is the true vine. He's the true Israel. And so therefore, when the Jews became Christians, they were actually leaving nothing. They were leaving something that was obsolete and dying away. If anything, those are the branches which are being picked up and thrown away and burned. Okay? It's the people who have never been believers. They're Jewish. They claim to know God. They've got all the religion. They've got all the background. But they've never actually believed in Jesus. So therefore, they have never been in this vine. Do you understand? They had a, a vine that was based on race, but they never had the vine that was based on faith. And you see, this is the whole point. Those who are saved by faith are in the vine of Jesus Christ. Amen. You see? And you will produce fruit. Those branches which are not producing fruit have never been in the vine. They're not branches that have been broken out. Go to Romans 11 for that one. All right? In John 15, the branches which are being talked about here have never been in the vine. This is the whole point. Okay? And uh, so when we actually understand that, then we actually start to see that this is not sort of some warning against backsliding or being an unfruitful Christian. This is a warning for, if anything, for the people who are not believers and who don't want to be believers. Become a believer. Become a believer, and then you'll be in the branch, then you'll produce fruit. Then you won't be burned, if you understand. But as for you know, you know, these branches, they're ones which have never actually been believers. Okay? Now, as such, the difficulty really comes with the translations that we use, and unfortunately there's no difference between the King James or the NIV. They both put it across in the same way. I, for one, would like to change the word remain to the word dwell. Okay? The word remain kind of implies that there's some kind of intention to leave, as if the branches want to leave the vine. Okay? It's not saying that, because I think that's the whole point. Once you're in the vine, you're in the vine, you, you're, you're not going to want to leave. Okay? The word dwell, however, has a much more subtle difference. Uh, you know, there's a subtle difference, and it has a much better meaning for this. It's saying, look, you need to live in Jesus. That's a gospel message, isn't it? You know, you need to live in Jesus. You need to come into Jesus, you need to get saved by faith, and you're going to dwell. Okay? And it's not telling, you know, it's not urging them to try and stay in. It's actually, if anything, telling them that they will dwell in Jesus because they're believers. Okay? Now, this is very important. Okay? Another translation bit, which is very difficult to actually understand, but it's actually very plain. Right? He says that there are branches in me. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Um, the branches in me, in verse 2. Right? He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Right? Now then, in the King James, I think it says he takes away. The word in Greek is iro, which means to lift or to carry or to bear up. Okay? So, because he's talking about pruning or whatever else, they've assumed that it means cut off. Cut off or takes away is not what it's talking about. In verse 2, what he says here is that with every branch that bears no fruit, he supports it. He bears it up. He carries it. Who's had an experience like that as a Christian? You're a branch in the vine, okay? And the fruit is coming in your life, but you're not bearing much fruit. You're struggling. The problem is your relationship with God may be not so good. Maybe you're not praying enough. Maybe you're going through a lot of temptation. Maybe you're not reading the Bible enough, and you're not growing in the way that you should. Well, at those points, God will carry you. God will bear you up. God will support you. So really, what he's saying is, I am the true vine. My father is a gardener. He bears up or carries every branch in me that bears no fruit. Right? While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. And again, the word prune 
we immediately think like we do as we're tree men or whatever else we go out and we we only want to hack and slash and cut things down right true pruning is a very very precise process which cleanses okay and that's an important word the word is actually um catharizo as i remember correctly right and it means to cleanse it means to cleanse so we might understand this as sanctification when you prune a fruit brush right you're not hacking it down to size you're training it so that it grows better right you cut off all the side branches that take away strength and so that the main branch will grow do you understand and it's not about destroying the vine it's actually about making it grow okay and the fact of the matter is that really if anything it's talking about sanctifying us it's talking about cleansing our life it's talking about taking the sinful nature out bits of your life which are sapping your walk with god and stopping you from producing fruit do you understand all right so you know i mean those things that distract you worldly things materialism distractions of all sorts god wants to take those out of your life so that you can serve him better so that you can produce more fruit for him do you understand this starts to make much more sense now don't we you see if this is supposed to be a message about encouraging the disciples about their christian life and overcoming obstacles and persecution and so on then you know you're not looking for condemnation you're looking for something to encourage and this is the point right he wants to prune those branches which are bearing fruit that means that when you're producing fruit in god don't expect it to stop there god wants you to produce more God wants you to go on. Don't think, oh, God will leave me alone now. I'm doing a bit for him. God's going to try and hone you and train you and push you on to do even more. He wants you to attain to the full measure of Christ. He wants you to do everything that Jesus did. Greater things even. Do you understand? This is what it's about. This is what it's about. I got off my notes a little bit there. Okay. You see, if he's lifting and supporting... And he's cleansing rather than cutting back. He's pruning to to cultivate. Then the whole thing becomes a lot, lot stronger. And then you start to see what it's all about. It's basically about becoming like Jesus. Having the image of God produced in you. Okay. Now, if you want to link it to another part of the New Testament, of course, Galatians 5 verse 22 is the most obvious. (coughs) There, uh, of course, it lists the, the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, not the gifts of the Spirit, that's a different thing altogether. The fruit of the Spirit, which is all about love, joy, peace, patience, self control, the character of Jesus. Okay, and so as you're going on as a branch in the vine, you are going to go on and you're going to become more and more Christ like. Correct? Okay, you're going to see love, joy, peace, patience, and self control come out in your life, faithfulness and goodness. You're going to become like Jesus. Now, the point is this who is it who actually does that? Is it you? Do you live a better life? Do you make yourself be patient? Do you control your temper? Do you try to do good? Do you try to be faithful? Can you sort... Can you? Can you? No, this is the whole point. You can't. By yourself, you can do nothing. Jesus says it here. You've got to be in the vine. By yourselves, you can do nothing. Right? You're not going to do it. Peter was full of, oh yeah, I can go and do it. But in his flesh, could he? No. A few hours later, he's on his face in the dust. "Ah, I can't do it. I'm not the big man I thought I was. Right? But what does Peter go on in later life to do? He does that because he's become humble and he's realized that it's in fact God who does it. Do you understand? This is the key to a successful Christian life. It's that God does it. Yes, of course, you have uh, choices to make. Yes, you have personal self-control. Yes, you must resist temptation. But even then, you do all those things by the strength of the Holy Spirit. Colossians 1.29 is my favorite. It's beautiful. Paul says, I struggle and labor with all his strength or power that works so within me. Do you understand? I work with his strength. (sighs) Beautiful, isn't it? Okay, this is the whole thing. In fact, going back to Romans 11, Romans 11 actually explains that when the branch is grafted in, the sap comes up from the root, the strength, the food, the nutrients, the water, everything a branch needs comes up from the root into the, through the graft into the branch and the branch produces the fruit for the plant. The branch can't do it on its own though, can it? Okay, 
but yet so often things will happen in our lives will be fruitful God is doing something in our lives and we think that we're doing it we take glory for ourselves cool I've got a good testimony cool I'm doing well I haven't done that for a week cool oh, as soon as you do that God lets you do it again all right just to remind you uh, 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 I'm the one who's doing it all right and the fact of the matter is that you know we need to understand we need to understand that God is pushing out the sinfulness and replacing it with his spiritual fruit okay and th- this is the key I mean I've used this illustration in the past in many ways it doesn't really work with this because the whole point is that the root is perfect already but when you have a fruit tree and it's got bad fruit on it you don't just go along and knock the bad fruit off and then say produce more fruit produce good fruit this time or I'll chop you down right that's not what you I mean ever had have you ever talked to trees anybody here talked to trees did you get a good response all right did it produce good fruit no what you do instead is actually the problem is not with the branch the problem is normally at the root and you put a bit of muck around the root and you water it and behold as the root grows stronger then the branches grow stronger okay (coughs) so you understand that the the issue is whether or not the strength is coming up from the root all right if you're finding that you're not producing fruit in your life then maybe you need to re-examine your relationship with God. Dare I say, you might be a believer, but you're a weak believer. You're not praying enough, not reading your Bible enough, not uh, spending enough time in fellowship, wrong company or what have you. And of course, you're weakening your relationship with God. Okay? And so therefore, his strength is not coming through in your life and you're not seeing the fruit of Jesus come forward. Well, you need to re-examine your relationship with God. You need to get on your knees more, metaphorically speaking. You know, I mean, you need to pray more. You need to spend time in fellowship. You need to watch the company that you keep. Maybe spend a little less time watching the TV or working and a bit more time in spiritual things. All right? And you will be strengthened. Going even further, perhaps you're not a Christian at all. Perhaps you're just a churchgoer. Perhaps you're just somebody who's joined the church and said a sinner's prayer. Oddly enough, sometimes that is uh, sort of paraded as salvation by faith. If you said a sinner's prayer, then you're saved. No, you're not. If you believe, then you're saved. All right? Otherwise, that would be salvation by works or salvation by ceremony or something. We could spot that in a traditional church. If somebody said, oh, I go to a certain church and the man says a prayer with me and uh, therefore I'm all right. You say, well, hang on a sec, you're not going to God. That's not a relationship with God. That's not salvation by faith. Right? That's salvation by works because you're going through that little ceremony or ritual with a man and so therefore you think you're saved. That's salvation by works. But a lot of people come to our churches and think the same thing. They think they can come to a church, say a prayer with a preacher or something else like that and just fill a seat and they think that they're a Christian and they're not a Christian at all. They haven't met with Jesus. They're not in the vine at all. And they may keep up a pretense for a few <laughs> years. You know, I know of a man who was two and a half years a Christian he'd said the sinner's prayer joined the church gave up a few things you know made an honest living came off the dole stopped smoking stopped drinking what have you right two and a half years down the line by which time they were thinking of making him a deacon in a church he said and his words were the lights turned on he met with Jesus two and a half years down the line they were going to make him a deacon in the church and he got saved okay and I reckon that, I mean, it doesn't have to be two and a half years, it could be two and a half decades. You know, we can't be complacent. There's many people who are complacent and think, oh, I've gone to church. They can even become a, like, that man was going to become a deacon. Dare I say, he could even become a church leader. Doesn't mean that you're saved. Doesn't mean that you're saved. You're saved because you're in the vine. Because you believe. Okay? And this is the key. Before long, eventually, <laughs> your fruit will be shown for what it is. You can only do so much by human effort. But eventually, just like Peter, he was shown for what he was. Eventually, it will always be shown for what it is. You see, the branches which are not in the vine, which have never been in the vine, I underline, according to John 15, they've never dwelt in Jesus. They're only going to wither and they're going to die. They're going to wither away and they're going to die. They cannot keep going. They can only go on for a certain amount of time. And you see, the fact of the matter is that we need to, you know, be aware of that. We need to be aware that there are pretenders within the church. Being a member of a church doesn't make you saved. Okay? Being in Jesus is where salvation lies. 
in Matthew 7 verse 22 it says that there's you know not everybody who calls me Lord Lord will enter the kingdom of God and it says but didn't we cast out demons and do this that and the other in your name so they may even attain to spiritual things like Judas Judas cast out demons Judas healed the sick Judas did amazing things preached the gospel but he was never in the vine he was never in the vine and the fact of the matter is that, you know, people will say, but I've done this and I've done that and I've done the other. It doesn't matter what you've done. What matters is whether or not Jesus has saved you. Because eventually it will crack. And the proof of that really, going to 1 John 2 verse 3 and 4 again, is the man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. The truth is not in him. And ver- first, um, chapter 3 and verse 9, it says that this is how we know who the children of God are. They do what is right. And you see, the children of the devil may join the church, but they're living by their sinful nature, they're not in the vine, and eventually, eventually, they'll be seen for what they are. Even if, unfortunately, it's after they die, you know, because they can keep up the pretense right until the end. Okay, so the thing is here, that there is no doubt, however, within this teaching about the relationship that these 11 disciples have with Jesus. He says, you are the branches, okay? You are saved, you are in the vine, okay? So there's no doubts there. And so therefore, on that basis, he's able to say, you will produce good fruit. And there's no such thing as a Christian who doesn't produce good fruit, okay? If somebody's not producing fruit, they need to check whether or not they're actually saved, all right? Um, and this is the thing. By extension, it's, it's, we're reassured here that all believers, without exception, will bear fruit, all right? And so therefore, you know, as we see this go through we can see that you know such as Judas he never actually dwelt in Jesus okay he was only part of the disciples group as it were okay and the contrast really there is with Peter because of course Peter he makes a mess of things but in the long term he produces fruit because in the long term he's working with God God is working within him to work this out you see and this is the thing when God is at work in somebody's life his fruit works through in their life. Okay? It's not my fruit. Otherwise it would be, you know, I've got a good testimony, glory to Jerry. But it's not. It's his fruit. It's his work in my life. That's what he is doing. You see? And he is the one who has changed me. Okay? And it's those who have never dwelt in Jesus who were actually cast out. And it's interesting here. Of course, because he speaks about burning here, immediately everybody thinks about end times and end times, judgment day, doomsday, what have you. But in fact, he says here, very specifically, they are being cast out and are being burned. Okay? He doesn't say they will be. He says they are. In other words, this is already happening. Judas would be the first, I would think. Okay? He's cast out and he's being withered. Okay? And it reminds us of John 3.18 where it says that those who have not believed in Jesus stand condemned already. And they are perishing. They are wasting away. Sin is corroding at their life. Sin is destroying them. The fact that they're separated from God, they're under a curse from God. They're condemned. And so therefore, they are withering. It's not, okay, you can reapply it to the end times and of course ultimately they will be burned in a very real sense but they are already withering away because they are condemned okay and so therefore you know we can see that this applies really to the here and now because this is in the present it's actually happening already as Jesus is speaking okay and it's not speaking as I underline it's not speaking about dead or fruitless believers because that's our point there is no such thing in this passage there is no such thing okay it's the unsaved who are dead it's the unsaved who are, unfru- who are unfruitful. Do you understand? And the whole point of this is to get that across. All right. Um, so, like I said, there's, there's this contrast between Judas and Peter. Judas was never in the vine, and so he withers, and of course he perishes. Peter, on the other hand, although he may make mistakes, in the long run, that's only because he was trying to do things in his flesh. But in the long run, as he receives that strength from God, as he builds up his personal relationship with God, then you see the fruit in his life come forth. And eventually, of course, he's actually martyred, as we'll read in John 21 when we get there. Okay? So, it's wonderful. There's this wonderful promise. Okay? Now, I've got down to about verse 7, because I've very, been very general about that. Okay? And as you get down to about verse 7 onwards, okay, um, 
then he says that various things about loving me and obedience and all this kind of stuff okay and you're never quite sure exactly where he's going to with this you see as it reads in this most translations it sounds like obedience or living by the commands is a condition for staying in God's love but I call your attention to the end of verse 10 where it says that Jesus says just as I have obeyed my father's commands and remain in his love are we to suppose from that that God the father only loved God the son because he was obedient but that makes sense Does that make sense to anybody it doesn't to me either okay the problem is with the word if okay most people immediately think of the word if and they think of it as being um, somehow conditional or an if yes if no sort of thing you know there's an option there a better translation of the word if here really would be the word since okay without going into the Greek grammar and all that um, it's basically that it's not conditional in that sense okay it would be like me saying to my children uh, since you are my child then this is how you will live now I'm not actually expressing any doubt that these are my children okay since you are my child it's because of this condition then therefore you will fulfill this okay so it's since you are in God's love then you will obey his commands would be a better way of putting it do you understand okay Jesus was loved by the father unconditionally okay if you start to bring in obedience as being a condition for being in God's love then that means that the love is not unconditional and what is love if it's not unconditional it's not love at all if there's a I love you because whatever then the love is not really love you know if you love somebody because they're beautiful what are you going to do when they get old and wrinkly right if you love somebody because they're clever what are you going to do when they get a bit senile okay if you love somebody because they're rich then what are you going to do when they get skinned okay the fact of the matter is that you love somebody unconditionally so when somebody says why do you love me the whole point is I don't know there is no reason I just do and that's the whole thing we're sinners yet Jesus loves us God loves us do you understand this is the whole thing you know it's while we were still sinners that Christ died for us being in God's love is not conditional upon anything do you understand and so therefore we have to look at this passage and we have to to realize that uh, you know we might be sort of reading into it what we want to see you know we might be saying okay I've got to obey God and then he'll love me of course not of course not because God's love is unconditional that's the whole point that's the whole beauty of it you see the fact of the matter is it's because we are dwelling in God's love then we live a life that reflects that and this is the whole point this is following on from the vine and the branches and the whole principle of the branches was that they dwell in the vine and so therefore the vine strengthens them and produces fruit this is a continuation of that so he's saying the same thing again you dwell in God's love and so therefore there will be obedience in your life and again like I said before there's no such thing as a Christian who doesn't live a Christ-like life do you understand if they're not living a Christ-like life they're not saved they've never been saved they need to get saved do you understand okay so we're not saying that holiness of life is a condition for salvation we're saying that salvation is a condition for holiness of life don't get the cart before the horse as many do okay you get saved and then Jesus changes your life this is the whole point and we're able to do wonderful things and he does that through the agency of the Holy Spirit which really is a much bigger teaching in chapter 16 but it's through the Holy Spirit that he does this and we've seen that the whole of John's gospel right from the beginning is all about being born again of the Spirit John 3 okay but it's not just John 3 it's John 4 John 5 John 6 John 7 all the way through it's all about being born again of the Spirit isn't it the whole thing is a teaching about John 3 okay as it continues and here he's actually giving us the technical doctrine or the theology behind it and he's saying this is why being a new creation is a work of the Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit who does it and he produces his fruit in your life okay this will be fulfilled in fact in John 20 verse 22 which is on resurrection day when Jesus returns to them and he breathes on them and says receive the Holy Spirit 
that's when the change happens. That's when the difference happens. All right? And as such, the, the work in John's Gospel, John is interested in the work of the Holy Spirit for rebirth, recreation, making you holy, making you like Christ. Okay? He's not interested, as such, in the work of the Holy Spirit in working miracles. That's all Luke's Gospel and Acts where he's got Pentecost. John is not talking about Pentecost. So as we read on in this, and we see the promises of the Holy Spirit, please do not try to connect it to Pentecost. It's not talking about Pentecost. It's talking about John 20, verse 22, which happens on Resurrection Day, six weeks before Pentecost. Completely different occasion. Because what we're starting to see now is the fact that when you believe, the Holy Spirit comes and makes his home in you. He makes his dwelling place in you. Okay? He dwells in you. Okay? Now, as you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, he will start to bring Christ out in your life. He starts to change you as a person. Your sinful nature drops away and your spirit is, you know, you become a spiritual person. Okay? Don't even think about baptism in the Holy Spirit at that point. That's a different occasion. Okay? For the disciples, it was six weeks later. Please don't get them mixed up. All right? And because sad to say that, uh, you know, quite often we do get them mixed up. And... As he goes on, then he says, look, my joy is going to be complete in you. you notice that he's mentioning many things which sound a bit like Galatians 5.22. He's talking about love. He's talking about joy. At the end of chapter 14, he talked about peace. He said, my peace I leave with you, live with you. Can't get my words out. My peace I leave with you. Okay? And the fact of the matter is he talks there about some kind of supernatural peace. Because he says, you know, my peace is not like the peace of the world. The people who are in the world, they have peace if they're in peaceful surroundings. When they're sitting by a nice lakeside fishing, they have peace. If they're in a war zone, they have turmoil. But the Christian is not seated in this world. The Christian is not living in their circumstances. We're living over the circumstances because we're seated with Christ in heavenly realms. And so therefore, because we're in Christ, then that means that we always have peace, even in the middle of a war zone. You see, there can be guns and knives and bullets and bombs going off all around us. But because we're in Christ, we have spiritual peace. We are above the circumstances of this world. We're unaffected. We're like the, we're like the plant in uh, the tree that has its roots going down to a secret lake underwater. And even though everything else is under drought, we've got water. And we're always producing fruit in season and out of season. Do you see? Because why our strength is coming from Jesus, not from our circumstances. The people of the world, you change the circumstances, you change them. You change the circumstances, you change their mood. But for the people of Christ, nothing ever changes. We're always green, no matter what the time of year, no matter what the circumstances. Do you understand? This is the beauty of it. This is what it's really all about. And what he's saying is, look, this is bearing in mind that this is all in the context of Peter saying, I'm ready to die for you. Okay? This is all a teaching that follows on from that. And Jesus is slowly but quite assuredly, building up to the point where he's going to tell them that they are going to die. He's building up to persecution. It becomes much clearer in chapter 16. Okay? And he's building up to that point where he's saying, you are going to be in a situation where it's going to be like a war. There's going to be people trying to kill you. There's going to be people trying to kill your children. There are people who are actually going to succeed in killing you and killing your children. They're going to threaten you with everything. But the Holy Spirit will give you strength to get through it. My peace I leave with you. Right? Not as the world does, but you have a deeper inner peace. Here he starts to talk about love and joy, and you'll have complete joy. Not that your life is going to be good. He's telling them here they're going to be killed. Right? He's not telling them they're having a good life. Right? He's telling them that they're going to die by the sword. Okay? But he's saying, I'm going to carry you through that, and you're going to have peace. I'm going to leave you an example, because I'm going to do as my Father has commanded me. I'm going to go to that rugged cross, and I'm going to die a miserable death. But he said, yet I am never alone. My father is always with me. And I'm going to carry it on all the way through to the end. I'm going to leave you an example. Remember that Jesus did that as a human being. He didn't have any advantage over us. And if you don't believe, like I said last week, if you don't believe in what Jesus did, and you think, oh, he was the son of God, he could do it, I can't. right? Well, remember who Stephen was. Do you remember in Acts 7? Stephen died a martyr's death, and yet he said the same words as Jesus. Forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. You understand? Stephen was a normal human being like us, wasn't he? But by the strength of the Holy Spirit, we see it happen. Later on, of course, in Peter's life, the same thing happened. Okay. 
fact of the matter is this is all about building them up to persecution and he says if you follow that through you'll be my friends to be a friend of God now that was mind-blowing for Jewish people in the Bible there was only ever a handful of people who were called friends of God Abraham Moses special people big people important people and here he is speaking to this 11 frightened men right and he's saying you're going to be God's friends all of you I mean that was amazing that's amazing but by extension he's saying this to us as well if we're willing to lay down our lives for Jesus and for each other then we'll be God's friends that's marvelous isn't it do you want to be God's friend okay the Jewish nation could only claim God as their father on a national level yes God is the father of Israel my nation but not on a personal level and they were very affronted when Jesus said God is my personal father he's my daddy as it were right I'm pinching something from Romans there all right but he's saying my father is my personal father God himself and they were affronted at that they couldn't they couldn't grab that but here he's saying look you're going to be intimate friends with God you're not going to be servants like the Jews maybe you're going to be his friends and the thing is a servant can be sacked for doing things wrong can't they a servant can be sacked for not working but a friend that's unconditional you don't have to do anything to be a friend do you that's better right that's much better okay so we're not slaves although Paul does call us slaves of righteousness later on the point is this that we're willing slaves if anything okay but not slaves in the sense that we've got to do this otherwise we'll get sacked okay it's salvation not slavation okay salvation not slavation we are to be God's friends but you see with this with these promises of the Holy Spirit and the strength with these promises that you'll be God's friend you know at the end of the day many people would doubt their suitability Peter doesn't at this point Peter thinks that oh yeah I'm going to be the hero me you know you see him when Jesus is arrested and he comes out with a sword you know and he's such a good shot he chops a man's ear off okay the fact of the matter is that you know <laughs> if it ever did depend on Peter it wouldn't have got very far anyway right you know with all these promises and this kind of stuff you know most people would doubt their suitability like we admitted earlier we're all cowards we would oh, I couldn't do that I'm not suitable the more unsuitable you think you are the more likely you are to be used it's the ones who think that they're suitable can't be used okay the ones who put themselves forward can't be used okay like Moses you know he said oh I can't do this and God says you will do it because you'll do it by my strength and that was a message of the burning bush in many ways it's that it was God who was making the fire Moses was to be that bush he was to contribute nothing he was just to stand there but it was God who was going to bring that fire and it's the same thing for us as Christians we contribute nothing really it's God who produces that fruit do you understand but with all these promises with all this encouragement with all this offer of gifts you know you're going to be God's friend and all this kind of stuff it says that we're chosen but we're also chosen for persecution you know I remember a couple of weeks ago I, I said who wants to accept the promises of God and we all go oh amen and God said you'll have troubles you're going to go through tribulation you're going to have persecution you may even die do you still want to accept the promises of God well they come as a package you see a lot of people only want to be Christians or ministers dare I say as long as the going's good and as long as the response is good as long as people are getting saved and people are coming to the meetings but it's very difficult when people are turning around and trying to throw stones at you but remember this people only throw stones at trees with fruit on them have you ever noticed that Spurgeon said that I chored it all right the fact of the matter is that you know if people are persecuting you it's usually a good sign and here he says if people hate you remember that they hated me first if they obey me they'll obey you okay if they hate me they'll hate you you're only to be like little Christs so take it as an honor take it as an honor and then even the persecution becomes a good thing and that's why in the midst of it you have joy later on Peter is persecuted when he's beaten and it says that they rejoice because they were found worthy of suffering for the name oh to have such an <laughs> attitude to have such an understanding that we could actually see persecution as a reason for joy you know it's not that you have joy in spite of your situation it's that you have joy because of the persecution 
That's amazing, isn't it? That's amazing. Because they recognized it for what it was. It's that people had seen Jesus in them. You see, as the fruit comes out in your life from Jesus, then people are going to see it and people are going to hate it. People don't want to see it. It makes them jealous. It means that you're being blessed by God and they're not. And they hate you for it. Cain hated Abel. Why? Because Cain was unrighteous and Abel was righteous. And you see it's again, it's, I mentioned it before in the earlier chapters, where people react according to their character. We blame circumstances but, and other people, but at the end of the day, we react according to our character. And they react with hatred. Why? Because the world is full of hatred. Sinful people are full of hatred and jealousy. And so that's how they react to you. Even though you're innocent, even though you may be doing them no harm whatsoever, just by being a Christian and bearing fruit for Jesus, they're going to hate you. That's what they did to Jesus. That's what they did to Jesus. And as such, he says here that the underlying reason is that they don't know God. They don't know God. And that would be very cutting, as it were, if the target for this is actually the Jewish leadership. Because the Jews of all people claimed, oh, we know God, automatically, because I'm born a Jew. Gypsies say the same thing sometimes, don't they? Oh, we all know uh, Jesus. We all know God. We all know the Lord, because we're gypsies. All gypsies know the Lord. As if gorgeous don't or something like that I don't know what it is right the fact of the matter is that you know they somehow think that you know and I, I think I told you before about the time it might have been on a Monday night that I told you just the men but there was a fellow who said that to me and I just flicked it open at 1 John 2 3 and 4 and where it says the man who says I know him but does not do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in him he threatened to jump all over me so I left <laughs> all right but like I say you know, the fact of the matter is that he couldn't say anything about that because his argument was with the Bible. I said, do you believe the good book? And he said, yes. Well, there you go, you see. This is how you know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Those who produce fruit are the people who are saved. Those who do not are the people who need to get saved. If they don't, they're withering and they are perishing and they are burning. Ah, not will do, but ah. Well, they will do as well. But for the time being, we're looking at the present. Okay. And you see, the Jewish people claimed that they knew God. They claimed that they were the people of God. But, you know, they just didn't. And the fruit of that we see actually through the trials. We see them breaking the laws. We see them breaking the morals of God. We see them lying and cheating and vying and being jealous and full of hatred and full of murder and full of hypocrisy. You know, uh, they're, they're plotting the murder of Jesus and they're engineering everything so that this man is killed. An innocent man who's never done wrong. And yet, it says later on, they don't want to enter Pilate's house because they didn't want to be ritually unclean so that they could eat the Passover. <coughs> How hypocritical is that? How hypocritical is that? They were full of murder, and yet they didn't want to be ritually unclean. What about the inside? What about the inside? He says here that they're without excuse because why they know the truth. Not only has he told them the truth, but also they've seen the miracles. He says here at the end. He says they've seen the evidence. They are the witnesses to the evidence. Okay? And yet they still won't believe. They're in pure rebellion against God. Pure rebellion. You know, he says here that if they hadn't have been told, if they hadn't seen, then perhaps they could be, you know, excused or without sin. But that certainly doesn't apply here. Romans 1 says that men are without excuse anyway. Okay. We cling to verses like this when it comes to people that loved ones that you know have died and as far as we know they're not Christians and we say, well, maybe they never heard the gospel. The truth of the matter is that they, they have. They have. Somebody once said, well, our grandparents never heard the gospel because the mission wasn't in this country. Gypsy Smith was around, was around about 50 years ago, 60 years ago now, when they were alive. They did hear the gospel. The gospel was preached. And they are without excuse. But the fact of the matter is that, you know, here we see that the ultimate proof that you are definitely saved is that you're persecuted by the world. Who's been persecuted by the people of the world? You've been insulted even? Okay, it's a sign. Even if you're hated by your family or your neighbor doesn't like you, always scowls at you, that's where it starts, okay? Some of us have been beaten up, you know. Unless Lazarus is here, I don't think anybody's actually been killed for it. But, you know, there's, there's, the fact of the matter is that persecution is a proof that we are in God. Like Spurgeon said, people only throw stones at a tree with fruit on them. Okay? <coughs> They're trying to knock the fruit off. And 
as we see that the fact of the matter is that Jesus goes on to suffer now at the end of this in verse 25 where he said that they're going to hate me and therefore they hate the father as well so there's no such thing as a Jew who says oh I believe in God but I don't believe in Jesus you know you can't have one without the other they come as a as a package right in verse 25 he says this is what was f to fulfill what was written in their law they have hated me without reason and that's a quote from Psalm 69 and if you remember we've picked up on all the Psalms wherever we've gone through and the truth is that the Psalms show certain things as proof from the Old Testament and this particular Psalm is Psalm 69 or maybe Psalm 35 is actually about uh, David it was written by David about how he was suffering even though he was righteous okay they've hated me without reason and Jesus actually cites this for himself and all the way through the last half of the book which is a book of glory right then the Psalms all point to Jesus being the righteous sufferer now this is very very important when it comes to witnessing with Jews because Jews will reject Jesus because he suffered they'll say no the Christ was supposed to remain forever he couldn't die the Christ couldn't suffer because if you're from God you'll be blessed by God and that means you'll have a lovely life that's the way they interpret the scriptures of course that's not based on scripture but that's how they interpret certain bits they have a supermarket religion whereby they go to certain bits of the Old Testament they pick out the bits that they like and they make a system up and then they leave it at that and they don't go back and the fact of the matter is that here they would look at Jesus and they say well he's suffering so therefore he cannot be the Christ he cannot be from God because otherwise everything would be lovely and everything would go his way that's very naive isn't it that's not what scripture says but here because John cites this scripture Jesus actually quotes this scripture from Psalm 69 this is to fulfill what is written in the law they hated me without reason the reason the Jews don't believe in Jesus is because he suffered but if it's in fulfillment of scripture then his suffering becomes the very reason why they should believe in him because he's fulfilled scripture now in terms of John speaking to the early church in terms of Jesus speaking to the disciples in terms of us witnessing to Jews today then we have to understand that many of their objections are not based on scripture they're based on their traditions or their own ideas and they need to realize that the very things that they reject Jesus for are actually the reasons they should accept him and we can turn that on that on its head if you ever have a chance to witness to any Jews please use that scripture use all of those scriptures that we've pointed out because they are very very powerful and they will be effective all right we're going to go on to speak about the counselor or the Holy Spirit next week so we'll start from chapter 15 and verse 26 next week all right remember though of course it's continuous it's not to say that it's on to a new subject but we'll stop there simply because I've preached for 58 minutes so let's bow our heads in prayer hallelujah hallelujah Jimmy, do you want to close in prayer?